Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are thrilled to have you here. I hope everyone is enjoying the conference. We're thrilled to be here with Black female state legislators. So, legislators. I am Clem Mesador. I am going to be your moderator. I am the executive director of Black Chain Foundation. We are a 501c3 focused on education. Today I have with me three fabulous female speakers who work in crypto. Two of them come from the Hill like myself. I previously served in the Obama administration and then worked in Congress for Congressman Barbara Lee and Betty McCollum. I've been working in crypto for about six years now, and I work at the intersection of public policy and crypto. So it's great to be in this conversation because you know, this is really about how do female state legislators think about their municipalities and how to actually bring about better value, especially as we've been talking about smart cities for a long time now. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. So immediately next to me is Amina Ross. She is Head of Policy for Cash App, a platform for consumers within Black. Previously, she was a Managing Director advocating for the capital markets industry, and prior to that, she was the Chief of Staff for a senior member of the House Financial Services Committee. She, is, she has almost 15 years of experience in public policy and in Congress. We are thrilled to have Amina Ross with us today. Next to her is Janae Eo. Janae is currently the Director of Financial Policy at Chamber of, Con of, Chamber of Progress, a center-left tech policy trade association advocating for consumers supporting technological leaps in our society. Janae used to work for she was still on the Financial Services Committee for Representative Beatty, who also co-chaired the, she's also chair of the subcommittee on DEI and Financial Services. Now, Janae learned about crypto and Web3 while working at Howard University. So that was my, my alum, so HU. So it is at Howard that she learned about Web3 and cryptocurrency and as she was involved in creating financial literacy programs for students on campus. And last but certainly not least is Oleinka Odegunen. Odenelin, oh, Odenelin, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Clav Mesador, they butcher my name all the time, so give me some breaks. <laughs> Yinka, as I'll refer to her, is a recognized educator, speaker, and advisor. She is, highly res she is a highly respected compliance, cybersecurity, and risk management expert. She is the founder and chairwoman of Black Women Black Chain Council, a benefit organization that educates the African diaspora about blockchain and creates, the oppor creates opportunities for black women in the blockchain ecosystem. Driven by her desire to make all sectors of tech inclusive and diverse, Yinka is creating pathways for black women across the diaspora to build on blockchain technology. Welcome, ladies. Now, thank you. Thank you. Do not, well, I'm going to channel a senior hall for those of you who are old enough. Do not adjust your television set sets. This is actually what crypto looks like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Black and Latino communities lead national adoption of cryptocurrency. And they say that there's not women in crypto. What they mean is that there's not a lot of wealthy women getting VC funding in crypto. Uh -huh. Because we dominate the ecosystem and the marketplace. So it's wonderful that as four black women, we are here to talk about what black women electives should be doing. So we'd like to kick it off with a few questions just to set the stage. We're here talking about smart cities. We've been talking about smart cities for a few decades now. And so now it is how do we build on the technologies we've been talking about? 
right? It's that it is no longer just about optimization and efficiency. We now have technologies in addition to blockchain when it comes to AI that can help us to leapfrog. But before we get into that conversation, I want each of you to please tell us a bit more about the work that you're leading and the intersection with cryptocurrency and policy. We'll start with you. Hi everyone, Amina Ross, I'm the head of policy for Cash App. And for those of you who are not familiar with Cash App, it's a consumer platform underneath the umbrella of Block. So bear with me, we have a lot of business units. Um, the one that you may be most familiar with is Square, which is our seller ecosystem. So Square serves small businesses. It started with a little white square that plugged into your phone and uh, it was a point of sale service for folks who couldn't afford to get the big machine back in the day. So um, that's where we started and then Cash App grew out of that. It's our consumer finance uh, platform and then we also have Tidal, which is a music streaming platform um, that, was one, that was founded by Jay-Z. He's now on our board. And we also have two other business units that are specifically focused on crypto. So Spiral, which is specifically for developers in crypto, and TBD, which is focused on decentralized identity. And that's what I'll be talking about um, today. So when thinking about smart cities and blockchain, um, I'll be talking about digital identity and, that, and how that can bring your state, your local municipalities, and the country into the 21st century. Hi everyone, my name is Janae Eo, and I am the Director of Financial Policy for Chamber of Progress. Um, most of my efforts recently have been on connecting policymakers to innovators and creators in the cryptocurrency space. So I spend a lot of my time doing outreach. I look for people working on projects and I bring them to policymakers and have them share what they're working on, why it's important, why it matters, um, because I think it's very crucial for policymakers to know that blockchain is happening in your backyard. It's not just something that's happening overseas, it's not happening abroad, it's happening right in front of you. And I think that you know, putting together this panel to talk about you know, ways that smart cities can help uh, keep America competitive with other, country, with other countries and cities around the world that are invested, heavily invested in blockchain technology and help set the scene for us to move forward into a new century of growth and prosperity. And before we go to Yinka, I wanna to touch on that point you just made, right? I often meet black leaders, especially leaders of, public, leaders of public institutions who are surprised to hear that black and Latino communities need national redemption of crypto because it's not happening within, they're not seeing it within their contemporaries. I tell them it's happening within the grassroots people who are not the part of your contemporary. So when people think, well, well how is this adaption happening? It is happening at the grassroots level in the masses. So it may not be happening where we have our most educated, our most connected, but the people you represent are already engaged. Excellent point. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Olienka O'Demarin. I'm the founder of Black Women Blockchain Council. Um, I come here by way of education. I know that you all have heard of blockchain so many times, Web3, cryptocurrencies, but even to that level, you probably don't even understand everything that encompasses this space. It is a fast growing space. It's a space that has um, come out of grassroots movement into your um, viewpoint in regards to regulation, in regards to the government's involvement, as well as different corporations. And what we're here to do is provide that education and also streamline the ability for our community to continue being involved in this space because this is the number one growing sector right now. Um, there's a lot of job opportunities for your constituents. There's a lot of um, opportunities when it comes to building on the platform. We want to make sure that this time around with this tech, that we do not get left behind, that we're one of the innovators that are actually creating solutions for us as people. Yeah. And I love that you brought up the job opportunities because 
we cannot fill enough of the crypto jobs Absolutely. around there. Yes. And in crypto, you don't need a degree because no one has a degree for crypto. It's barely <laughs> a decade old. Many of the applications are drag and drop, so you don't really need to be technical, right? And also, it's not spooky. We're hiring accountants, <laughs> executive assistants. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the positions are virtual, right? So for those folks who are looking at the great, the great resignation or the private resignation, look to crypto. Well, that leads me to a level set, right? Let's start with what is blockchain, what is cryptocurrency, what is Web3, and I'll go through that very quickly. So what is, what, what is blockchain? This is my simple, very basic definition. Blockchain is technology that securely verifies information, facilitates the exchange of value with our third party. So again, technology that securely verifies information, that's the ledger you hear about, facilitates the exchange of value, that's cryptocurrency. Without third parties, that is decentralization. Now, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, think of them like the light, beautiful and bright, what powers the light is electricity. Blockchain is what powers the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. That may sound interesting. What's more interesting is, think of what a waste it would be if all we did with electricity was light. And think of everything we do with electricity beyond light. That is the power of blockchain technology. There's many different access points as you've seen and many different ways to get involved other than buying cryptocurrencies. And lastly, I would talk about Web3. You hear this term a lot. There's not one basic definition, but I will show you my basic definition. Everybody means something different when they talk about it. And most of the times when people talk about Web3, they're not talking about blockchain. They're actually talking about off-chain applications. But, when, but the most basic definition of Web3 is think of the iteration of the web that we're in right now. This is Web2, right? Those of us who are old enough remember when we were, there was no WW for everyone, right? That had to evolve. So we are in Web2 right now. We're in a space where the, where the internet is extremely important. It connects us globally. I'm sure you have some 80-year-old relatives who know how to FaceTime and WhatsApp but couldn't handle a computer. So, but we do know there are problems, right? Identity breakdowns, they're selling your information, data breaches. So how can we leverage blockchain technology, smart contracts, cryptocurrencies to solve some of those problems, give people back control of their data, make sure you're having immersive, authentic experiences, and also build on what we have and we actually need, which is the internet. That's one definition of it, that's its most basic. The next iteration of the web, a decentralized web. But when you think about Web3 and what's come out of the Ethereum blockchain, all of these applications and protocols anchored in smart contracts that are powering gaming, that have powered NFTs. So you have a, you have through the, the Ethereum blockchain, a lot of products and services to fuel the marketplace. Then you have things like decentralized autonomous organizations. I didn't want to go too in the weeds, but basically that's blockchain, that's cryptocurrencies, that's Web3. But for the purposes of this conversation, we want people to know that crypto is not that sexy. It's about efficiencies and optimization. So we're talking about smart cities. What are some of those use cases that we should be thinking about? We'll start on the other end. Well, one of the use cases that we should be thinking about is a concept that a friend of mine is actually building. Um, giving the neighborhood, individuals within the neighborhood, the ability to have incentive to, to build their neighborhood. So they're using this concept of decentralized autonomous organization, which in layman's term is kind of like a co-op. It gives people the ability to all uh, vote in the direction that the co-op is going to move in. Similar to that, we have that in uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs. So my friend is creating this concept where in a block, we can have the individuals within that block be able to be incentivized 
to continue building that block. It can also be an incentive to maybe stop gun violence in that particular neighborhood and also drive up the ability for individuals to feel like they have value in their neighborhood and feel like they have value in building their neighborhood. So they are being incentivized to continue to add value and build those neighborhoods. And I think that's a good way of starting to utilize blockchain. I love that. Just think of what we hear about the food deserts, right? And these are in our communities and we're waiting for developers to come to actually fix that. So what you're talking about is community, communities being able to generate the revenue, the resources to actually create that ecosystem and solve that problem on their own. I would say uh, a major use case that I've been researching is in Wise County, Virginia. Uh, this is a very rural county in Southwest Virginia, and one of the challenges that they face, along with many other counties across the country, is being able to centralize their record keeping and centralize their paperwork, specifically when it comes to the transfer of property from one owner to another. So Wise County, Virginia has piloted a program where they store titles uh, land titles and other property information onto the blockchain to make sure that it's easy for people to close on sales of their homes or land. Um, and also just to make sure that all of the records and information on a specific piece of land is in one place. Um, as technologies change throughout the course of history, uh, sometimes data can get lost. And with that data loss comes, you know, information about maybe who owned the land, what happened to the land, maybe there was a fire on the land, which can impact, you know, insurance. Um, it can also impact if there's a lien on the property. Uh, so by putting everything on the blockchain, it, it makes it a lot easier for people to, to search for 40 years of data or more, depending on how old our counties are. It makes it easier for people to search for data within seconds instead of you know taking a few days to locate records and maybe looking in different uh, different uh, databases to find information that's specific to a specific land plot. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna get a little bit interactive. So I know we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about you know cryptocurrency, but who in this room has had a checkbook before? Okay, so when we're talking about a distributed ledger or the blockchain, think about it as a checkbook that gets checked by everybody else. So within a, <laughs> exactly. So when you think about um, what is the benefit of this technology, the benefit is that in the past, you know, especially in communities of color, the person that was checking everything didn't look like us. And so that centralized power with individuals that maybe received it through historical discrimination, that is no longer the case. This is a different paradigm where everyone is able to check everybody else's work and make sure that the money is in the checking account the way that it's supposed to be. So with the blockchain, um, one of the things that um, we are working on at Block is decentralized identity. So the way that Club was talking about um, moving the ball forward and people owning their own data, well, what is some of that data that you may want to own? One of those is your identity. So right now, how do you prove your identity? A passport, a birth certificate, um, your driver's license. All of, the, all of these things are physical documents. And as we go into an economy into a global world where you know your identity needs to be verified on the internet, we have to have um, solutions like digital identity. So folks know this is the actual person I'm talking to, this is where they're from, this is their information, and I'm not being you know um, bamboozled. And so some states have already started down this path. Uh, the first one was Colorado. They have a digital ID app that runs on the blockchain. And one of the great things about the blockchain is because it's able to be updated quickly that several people 
are able to like check it, you're able to keep those records as fresh and accurate as possible. So you can think in 30 days what some of the you know benefits of that could be voting rolls, you know, um, real estate information, all of those things. If they're on the blockchain and they can't be tampered with, it's something that will benefit our community as a whole. And let's think about all of those communities that actually, all of those communities that actually, what people don't have birth certificates. They can't access anything because they can't. So this concept, well, it's a larger concept of mm -hmm. self-sovereign identity. One of the examples that it makes me think about in New York City, Mayor Eric Adams actually shared that New York City has the first baby born on blockchain. What does that mean? <laughs> but that baby's identity has now been recorded and stored on a blockchain. So therefore, if that baby ever loses their social certificate, and the county does too, that baby still exists. <laughs> and so, so, so this whole concept of identity is so important, especially with real estate. Property is a big part of how people of color build wealth, but it's been one of the one of the ways that we have been disenfranchised, mm -hmm. right? Can't prove it's our land. No one knows where the paperwork is. But so all of these things, as we think about smart cities, and as we think about cities like Detroit, like El Paso, like Oakland that actually needs this. Which brings me to Oakland. One of my favorite examples is in Oakland, we had a few developers in, in the crypto space who went back home to Oakland, connected with the mayor and the city council. They actually talked about how to revitalize Oakland. They decided that a cryptocurrency coin for Oakland to do that would be great. And they created Oakcoin. And so Oak Point is actually about revitalizing for small businesses, for community development. It was interesting. I was speaking at the U.S. Black Chamber's Policy Summit during ALC, and I was telling the president of U.S. Black Chamber about it. He's like, oh, I already know about it. And I said, well, how do you know about Oak Currency? Oh, Huey P. Newton's widow told me about it. So when you're not hearing it from tech people and you're hearing about it from community leaders, elders in the community, you know that they've actually are working on a project that's about empowerment. Right? And I think that's one of the things that's been great about how people of color are leveraging blockchain. It is really how do we solve some of the problems in our community. Now, we wouldn't be having a panel with female state legislators without talking about policy. Like, there's a lot going on at the federal level, there's a lot going on at the state level. To be honest, a lot of debate here in Washington. But in but within within the state there's a lot more going on. There's more traction being gained there. So therefore, as but but also we want to know some of the risks and the opportunities as well. So I would like each of our panelists to share, and that mic might be better. We'll, yeah, we'll start with you, Janine. Share a, a regulatory policy issue that you think our audience should think about, and also, what are some of the risks they, they should be thinking about, and how can they mitigate that risk? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest risks today is uh, misinformation and lack of education on cryptocurrency, Web3, um, blockchain technologies. And so one of the things that I've seen across uh, the 50 states are just the creation of regulatory sandboxes for crypto companies to come in and, and operate under just increased um, collaboration with uh, state regulators and state policymakers. I've also seen a couple of states create task forces where they have a, a coalition of policymakers who are interested in just learning more about blockchain technology and how they can leverage it to, to best help um, make their states more efficient. Um, so those are very um, good opportunities to take when it comes to figuring out what this is and how we can actually use it to benefit um, our residents for whichever state you're living in. Uh, but that requires education, uh, that requires information, and that requires being able to connect with people who are, who are genuinely creating and innovating in this space, not people who are just looking to make a quick buck and, and, and disappear into the night. I would say the other one is ignoring this space. 
Um, so much is happening right now, and there's so many different opportunities for yourself as well as your constituents that um, it will be detrimental if you ignore it. Um, a lot of cities who have already tapped in are seeing the benefit to their um, residents, um, as well as the different opportunities that are in this space. We know that this blockchain ecosystem, we've been here for a while, we've seen a lot that has changed, but we also know that the future generation is gonna come in, and they're gonna come in knowing it like it's the back of their hand, you know? Uh, and so it's important for it to be an intergenerational um, connection with, within families, within cities, within neighborhoods, and be able to tap in for the opportunities that it's bringing. And I mentioned before that we do not want to get left behind. So we need to create solutions that's going to benefit us. Um, because best to believe, others are creating solutions, but not, they're not creating it with the intention of benefiting the people that they hope it would benefit. So when we get involved, we will create it in a way that it's going to be for social good, that it's going to be a way that it's going to help elevate us in so many different ways. I think for me, um, one of the risks is the fear of the unknown. And I like to think I'm, I, I'm a Capricorn, so I like to think that I know everything. And, you know, I went to law school, so that makes it 10 times worse. Um, so when I was first getting into this space, it was really difficult for me because I was like, well, like, this, like, what is this? Like, bank money, da 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 da. And I wasn't really giving it a chance of like, what are the opportunities for my community? What are the opportunities for people that haven't had, you know, economic opportunity in the past? I had so many obstacles up because it was something that I did not understand. And, you know, Club is one of those people that like, guided me and brought me along. But, um, I think one of the things that we have to be open to is the idea that um, this can fit into a framework of consumer protection uh, to benefit small businesses, local governments, state governments. But if we're not in the room, as um, Alayinka said, then no one's going to fight for our um, for our community. And so I think fear of the unknown and like getting on on the bicycle, even if you fall off a little bit, you know, this space is only a, a decade old. Um, so most of the people that you hear talking about it, they've only been doing it for two, three, four years. And so it's really still the nascent stages of the industry. And so you haven't missed the bus, you haven't like, miss out on anything, you just gotta start somewhere. And so I think that's one of the risks and an opportunity, so. No, and excellent. Excellent point. This might not work so much, but, so, but excellent point, because as we wrap up, it's important for people to know that there are all regulations for crypto. It's not unregulated. What we need is regulatory clarity and that we need those people in this room to think about it because the masses you represent, your constituents, your stakeholders are already engaging. So if they don't have representation in Washington in the state houses, right, they're just going to become consumers because right now they are leading adaption. So I know we have to wrap up, but do we have time for one question? If there's even a question. Any questions? So I'm actually not a state legislator, but I am. I work for AARP, and so we've got 38 million members um, who are ages 50 and older. And there's always this question around privacy, particularly data. How do you? What What do you recommend in terms of educating older Americans who are very skeptical about crypto and data usage and their privacy? And I, I definitely want everyone here to speak. One thing I will say, what right now we have the data that shows that black and Latino communities are the largest holders of cryptocurrency. 
We don't have the data yet, but I'm, com I'm, I'm, convinced, I'm convinced of it. Senior communities, which were the after millennials who adapted the sharing economy, so the sharing economy is driven by millennials and boomers. <laughs> like, they are the greatest use of it. The, I, I believe what we will have the data in the next years that show that seniors are also holding crypto and leveraging crypto. The amount of times I hear that somebody says, oh my God, my mom's senior community, she calls me, they're trading crypto, so they're, they've created a, exchange accounts. Right? Because it's really about who has a pain point and how do they solve it. And when you have a pain point, you look for solutions. Right? The, what, the one thing that people don't realize, blockchain is actually very well protected. Nothing is unhackable, but when you look at all the technologies we have right now, and privacy is one of those things that you actually gain. And that's why it's a bit more complicated, more stepped, but the trade-off is more privacy, more security. Yeah, just to add on to what Claire said, I know we were good times up, but just want to quickly add the fact that Fidelity has a 401k that actually has digital assets in it. So the seniors, um, our older generation, are going to be introduced into this. There are educational platforms, and Black Women Blockchain Council does provide education, as well as CLEB with policy, and you know, Cash App has their education. There's a wealth of education, because one thing that we're doing in this space as Black women, as a Black community, is knowing that we gotta educate our people. And that's important, and that's what we're doing. Final thoughts, ladies. Just to quickly answer your question, sorry, I'll keep this brief. I'm an accountant by trade, so I spend a lot of time preparing tax returns for our seniors. And one of the things that I always get seniors through on the questionnaire is on cryptocurrency. And so I use that as an opportunity to educate and provide materials on cryptocurrency if they just want to understand what Bitcoin is, how, how to file it particularly, how to keep track of any currency that they do own. And you'll be surprised, a lot of people do own Bitcoin, they own pieces of Bitcoin, and then they also invest indirectly through a 401k. But it is uh, it is something that is uh, that seniors, if they are interested in learning more, there are plenty of avenues to, to figure out just from you know, the beginning of you know, using Cash App or investing in a 401k all the way up into tax season at the AARP tax clinic. Thank you. And so we also did an educational initiative with Cash App in conjunction with Jay-Z and Jack Dorsey this summer. That was in Marcy Housing Complex in Brooklyn, New York. And we were able to have their residents come in an eight-week program and learn about financial health, making sure they're not um, victims to scams, and also learning about blockchain and crypto. And the number of folks who were in those classes, I would say it was 50-50 in terms of like younger people and older people. And a lot of times the older folks brought their grandchildren or you know their children to the classes. So I really see older people as kind of a conduit for moving information around our communities. So we serve them first with the education and it will get out to the rest of our community. <laughs> All of our organizations are focused on data and research right now and, and, and collaborating with P groups. So I, for the Blackstream Foundation, we actually have a, a partnership with Consumer Reports where we're going to be focused on wealth building and wealthness, focusing on the next generation of innovators and what is driving them and how they're investing in a non-traditional way. And so lots of opportunities for folks to connect with those of us here, but other organizations as well. On that note, thank you so much for joining us.